All right, this is the pre-class video for class number uh, 13, Thursday, July 22nd. Um, and we are talking about Confucius, Confucianism, and its application today in current, um, in our current political social life, as well as its, um, the attitude of the US founding fathers toward Confucianism and the Analects. All right, so I have, we have a number of things that I wanted to point out in terms of the process of the class. Um, last time we finished up the section on political virtues and the post from two days ago has paper topics all connected to Aristotle's um, social and political virtues. So your first paper, um, anyway, you can write on those, something on those virtues. Um, if you haven't already written on them. And our wrap up for last time included Black Lives Matter. And I did wanna point out that the Black Lives Matter movement still has trouble with organized religion. There are plenty of organized religions that churches and preachers that are against Black Lives Matter. Some of them are white supremacists, some of them are just lukewarm moderates who think we're going too fast. There weren't as many of those though, because it's obvious that 50 years ago, uh, people were saying that. And so it, it looks kind of bad to say that same thing. Um, King was a radical conservative, but he was labeled a radical progressive. Uh, that's still true today about Black Lives Matter. Um, our founding fathers were actually very radical left-wing political traitors and heretics. Again, that's all been forgotten. And we're right back where we started. Even though he was a conservative, Black Lives Matter leaders are conservative. They were labeled liberal extremists. Um, we have a natural capacity to recognize the truth, even though we get socialized into racism and other lies still happening. Um, there is a um, higher percentage of African-Americans who are having given more opportunities than they were. They're in positions of authority. Liberal arts education is designed to wake up our capacity for intellectual honesty. Uh, King compared what he's doing to Socrates. He unified faith and reason, science and religion. So if you wanna go with that for your next paper, that's great. Um, Confucius outline. So I wanted you to finish reading the chapter in Houston Smith's book. So it's a pretty long assignment for um, Thursday. You can catch up. Um, but I would like you to be able to respond to a number of different aspects of that uh, assignment. The first, the first point that we talked about already to some extent was when civilization collapses, what are the options? Some students want, might want to pursue that uh, line of reasoning a little bit more. There's realism. I use the use of force, but that doesn't last very long. There's love, sweet love, uh, but that um, is, isn't forceful enough, right? That's what Jesus advocated. And that's why the Western tradition includes getting your heart in the right place, but then you have to start making judgments related to practical wisdom that include you know, having laws and having punishments for people who break them, but the punishments shouldn't be too much or too little. 
So just love isn't going to cut it, at least not to Confucius. Uh, the U.S. founding fathers were, Confucius would say they were too idealistic, that reason is not a good foundation. We've talked about that, where the founders wanted, you know, religion is fine and it's good for character development, but you have to act like a citizen. Citizens have to have a strong character, but they shouldn't bring their religion in in an exclusive way, right? Okay, so the West approach would have been rejected by Confucius, right? Um, so we have to rethink our own cultural tradition and what are its weaknesses. Um, Confucius set up this belief in the good old days. He was a social genius, right? He knew how to take a society in chaos and very carefully start structuring a tradition based on this complex network of relationships. And um, that would be weaving people together in that particular way. Um, all aspects of society were controlled to lead to the internalization of Confucian values. Uh, children, when they first learn to read, human beings are by nature good. <laughs> all right, now, given that, given the stereotype about the Chinese are the opposite of Americans because China emphasized unity and harmony and conformity and America is freedom and individuality and rugged individualism and all that stuff, right? China has mac maximum government. The U.S. has minimum government. Given that, it should surprise you that our founders were very concerned that the values, the way of life, the character traits that Confucius advocated would become a deeply embedded part of American culture. So even though the Declaration of Independence didn't talk about it and the um, Constitution doesn't, they wanted the social networks to be very Confucian or to, to people to really exercise those virtues, especially empathy, getting along with each other. Um, that mattered a lot to them. Um, Thomas Jefferson, right? It's amazing to me when I, a student wrote this paper and I assigned you to read that paper. Um, so Jefferson said, you know, this is a, a non-doctrinal religion. It's just a series of character traits, right? And very admirable. Jefferson said it's a great model. Benjamin Franklin published excerpts from Confucius. Amazing. He created a unit, united party for virtue because he, he wanted to get over Christianity was too much um, focused on different denominations and animosity between those denominations, but virtue would be the bridge between people. Um, let's see, all right. Okay, good laws are not enough. Our founders knew that we have to have these other character traits like Aristotle said. So obviously they, they were um, taking from uh, the Greeks and the Romans view of virtue also. Um, Confucius, Jesus, and Socrates, they were very aware of this. Um, a manual for public devotion, it omitted any biblical passages, right? But it included Proverbs from Confucius and other Eastern poets. That's pretty amazing. Why? Because that would be a common ground. Whereas quoting from the Bible, you know how that goes. Everybody has their Bible quote to justify just about anything, just like when we read the youth of Pro. So they're thinking Confucius Analects is a, is a way to not have any of those associations, 
but to have a clear, simple description of a virtuous life. Um, <clears throat> uh, virtue is our best security, right? We need armies for defense, but virtue is our best security. And Confucius says that in his idea of a good ruler, right? What does a good ruler need most? The trust of the people. Um, all right, then I have you reading some articles. So one of those attachments, and I'll show you the attachment. Uh, this is, a, you should have read it by the time we get to class. But so this guy, Travis Bradbury, he's making millions of bucks writing books that just pretty much say, what Confucius or Stoics or, you know, just about everybody in the ancient world already said, but they're making a lot of money on it. And I don't, I'm not sure they know <laughs> that, that they're doing that or if they really think they made this stuff up or what, but they're getting great reputations. Um, and then there's always this leading educator of virtue you know every couple of years there's a new one and that one makes a lot of money and then that fades and then there's the next fad because in the meantime you know the economy is tanking or it's not and we're declaring war or we're not and the political guys are saying all these nasty things <laughs> you know and then these virtue teachers come along so I don't know. I guess I'm jealous. They get paid millions. I just go right back to the original text. I don't get paid nothing. I can't even get students to take my class. Like, where did I go wrong? Trouble with me, I'm not good at branding myself, right? I need a student that will tell me, Dr. Beck, you need to create a brand, right? And, you know, I don't just want to be an influencer. I want some bucks. <laughs> Give me the box, but anyway, whatever. So, you know, he says, good leaders can tolerate conflict. You don't seek it, you don't avoid it. Boy, that really sounds like the mean between extremes, maintain their composure, uh, present their positions calmly, withstand personal attack. All their behavior is for the sake of the good of the company or the organization. Don't get distracted. Um, judiciously courageous is willing to speak out, say what no one wants to. I was just like, you, I mean, you've got to put a footnote here. This ain't fair. Uh, you stole this straight out of Aristotle, right? Speak wisely, the right time, the right place, the right way, the right reason. You're in control of your ego. You have an ego, but you admit when you're wrong. Oh my goodness. <laughs> someone else's way, um, are willing to do things someone else's way just to maintain harmony. You're never satisfied, always improving, recognize when things are broken and fix them, right? Admit, admit to the problems, take responsibility. Um, you're li liked by your coworkers. You develop friendships, right? Um, you neutralize toxic people, bring it all together. All right, so that's, it just seems pretty crazy that somebody thinks that's some new trendy thing. And Mr. Bradbury's book costs a lot more than just buying Confucius Analects for a couple bucks. Anyway, life goes on. Um, all aspects of the society were okay. So. Then we talked about the articles about Confucius life. And, you know, you do need to remember that Jesus died not knowing if anybody would understand him. Socrates died not knowing what his legacy would be. Confucius died not knowing, you know, his legacy. Um, on average, it was about 70 years after they died before their um, before stories, Analects started getting uh, written or told. Well, the stories were told, I'm sure, right away, but starting to get written down. Uh, Plato was a little sooner, but, you know, it wasn't like journalism. It's not precise. It was all trying to create this image 
of a person of high moral standards and recognizing how to tell a story, might have been a true story, might not, but it, a story of the kind of thing that person would do in a certain kind of situation, right? So this is how he was. Uh, he wanted to be hired as a political advisor, which certainly Socrates um, wanted to talk to political leaders or any kind of leaders to um, have conversations about how to use their authority wisely, rule for the sake of the ruled. He was a great teacher. He asked questions. He was humble about his abilities. He was homey, just like Socrates. Um, and he had democratic instincts, concern for the common person. He had a very common background, same with Socrates, sense of mission, high demand on himself. Um, well, same with Jesus, right? Who do you think I am? That's what Jesus said. Um, he wanted, Jesus, you know, spoke up to the religious leaders, the ones with religious authority. It was a, it was a religious um, reform movement that he was mostly concerned with. And <coughs> Jesus didn't want it to be politicized at all. And he knew that his enemies were making it political. But in one quote, he says, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. So that quote is used extensively to justify the separation of church and state, which is obvious. <laughs> like, yeah. And after 9-11, we didn't do that. You can find different quotes. You can just ignore the quotes. But um, uh, Confucius, all these leaders wanted <laughs> to focus on the character traits of the leaders. And then given that, what sort of decisions would you make? They're not interested in political movements or political parties or political power, but they're concerned about giving advice and having dialogues with people who do have power. Um, Jesus, Socrates, Buddha, he was uh, a common person, right? Concerned with common people. Um, Jesus went to the dance, went to the wedding, changed the water into wine. They could enjoy life. Um, okay. So he went with his disciples, same as Jesus and Socrates. Um, but Confucius went farther, right? Uh, all around China. G uh, Socrates didn't have disciples, but people did follow him around. He didn't ask them to but he didn't stop them from doing it. Um, but Jesus had, you know, the 12 men and they did travel around, um, but he was ignored and almost starved. Okay, so what about his analects? He had this really, you know, the focus was what does it mean to be a real Chinese person? Back in the golden age, right? This is the real China. Um, and Confucius also was considered a scholar. And so I was in China and there was a Confucius center, Confucian center. And he is portrayed with a book right in his lap. He is the scholar. And in China, education is really important. Taking these exams and doing well um, I was in China during these exams and the weather was really yucky. And so the, a woman from Aus, Austria, I saw her, I used to go over to the McDonald's to get an ice cream about 9.30 every night before they closed. And um, there were people from all over the world and also the Olympics was on or something. I mean, it was crazy. Uh, this is China, they're watching the Olympics, they're uh, eating McDonald's, there's all these people. Okay. And she said that actually the government had seeded the clouds so the weather would be horrible so the kids would stay inside and actually study more for their test. <laughs> all right. Um, but, you know, if we're going to compete with China economically, you know, 
first of all, we have to go green and we have to, because that's going to be the new big product that will make billions and trillions of dollars. And we're getting behind because of our stupid fossil fuel forever people controlling our political um, climate. But anyway, and then also education is fundamental. There's no way we're going to be able to compete unless we have well-educated people and edu people educated in science and technology. Well, guess what? We're, we're, you know, pandering to people's disdain of science. In Arkansas, uh, biology teachers have an option or there was a a bill introduced that they could choose whether to teach creationism or evolution. I don't know if the bill passed, but the idea is that it was presented so that people would vote for the party of the people who presented the bill. Yeah, that's my brand. But how are we going to compete with the Chinese? And then we're going to hate the Chinese. You know, they're out to get us. No, we destroyed ourselves. I'm sorry. But anyway. So Confucius was a scholar, and that's a tremendous advantage culturally in, in that respect. Education is valued. The disadvantage is the conformity. It's hard for them to generate innovation, new ideas, right? Um, so we balance each other off. We have uh, the opposite strengths and weaknesses. Um, all right, so his idea of a human being um, is a sense of dignity, right? And the stereotype is that um, there's no inner life. You are your relationships. But there's actually, you know, there's plenty of Confucian quotes, analects that, that refute that. Then I, you know, I picked out some of my favorite, and I think that I hope the students like them. And you, you're required to pick out your two favorite and why, and then you have to create your own. So I think that the page numbers I have here are from the same book that I assigned. Um, and, you know, I sort of summarized why I picked that quote, the five constant relationships. So, um, Confucius emphasizes inequality, and that's another thing about the Greeks. It, most of our relationships are unequal, which is, at a mat, as a matter of fact, is true. But in, in our society, we keep denying it, we ignore it, we don't see it. But fundamental is a parent's responsibility to raise a virtuous child. That's a very unequal relation. And you should know how to understand the power you have and how to exercise it well, right? So father, um, parents, children, even siblings, right? Elder sibling, younger sibling, within a family, uh, the generations, uh, friendships. They're not all equal. There's friendships between elders and youngers, uh, employer, employee ruler, subject, um, and family is the most basic. So, so our founders knew, you know, that we've got to have rugged individualism, um, self-motivation, uh, minimal government, but we also have to have all these relationships where people choose to weave themselves together and, and they know the art of relating. Um, okay, Confucius character, People um, talk about a person because they need a role model of someone who's completely civilized, someone to imitate. So Jesus is a role model, Socrates. Um, but people pick out different stories from each of these. And, you know, it can get to be pretty fixated, like the way he rolled up his mat or something. <laughs> well, it's the same, you know, it gets that way. Um, in any person that you use as a role model. I'm not a sage, but I seek wisdom. That should sound <laughs> pretty familiar. Um, so how to rule. So we're, now we're going from personal virtues, social virtues, political virtues. Um, 
the realists were too authoritarian. Um, there was a need for economic stability, but the most important is the trust, is the a trusting relationship between the ruler and the ruled. Aristotle says the, the foundation, the fiber, the fabric from which political association comes is that citizens have trust and goodwill for each other. And that includes ruler and ruled because they're all citizens. So trust and goodwill. Um, people consent, um, the spontaneous consent that just admitting somebody knows more than you, they have more expertise. We have Americans just keep voting for people with no expertise as if there's nothing to a political rule when it's actually extremely complicated and difficult. Um, okay, they have to be able to compel respect. They have to be sincerely related to the common good, not personal ambition, um, governed by moral example. Um, these are all really good uh, pieces of advice or descriptions, right? Um, have to be no predilections or prejudices, right? You don't come at something with stereotypes, assumptions. Um, you just look at things for what they are, right? Intellectual honesty, commitment to truth, fairness to posing points of view, right? All these things weave themselves together. Um, he also liked culture, music and culture. Um, the arts, the power of the arts to transform human nature. And so um, Confucius analects are like poetry. And so uh, Confucian children are educated in the poetry of Confucius. He's a scholar, right? Scholar bureaucrat is valued more than a soldier. Um, he's deeply touched by music. Your character is formed by the poets and perfected by music. Is that who we vote for? You know, do we check out who's running for president? Who likes poetry? <laughs> yeah, really. Um, okay, this. All right. So, how many uh, names for relatives can you think of? China has 110. Uh, you're not supposed to bring a lawsuit. That just meant you couldn't take care of your own affairs. So is this a religion or an ethic, right? So, um, you know, the word religion is incredibly fraught. <laughs> it's not a doctrine. It's a way of life. Um, heaven and earth, you can, Neo-Confucians today, consider Confucius an environmentalist. He would want a sustainable culture. So again, China has an advantage over us. When the leader of China decides he's going to prioritize sustainability, he can refer very easily to Confucius and Confucius analects. He has the culture with them, and then he has the power to do it. He can just mandate that um, they start building green tech. Now, if they don't have the experts and if the US keeps resisting, he'll just hire a bunch of Americans and an American is gonna go and work for him, not because he wants China to be powerful, but because he wants to stop you know, carbon emissions. And, I just don't understand why we have our, we've gotten ourselves into this awful uh, kind of culture and feedback loop. Um, what kind of impact he had? He had tremendous impact, right? So there's, when you decide, you know, what do you want to do with your life? What does it mean to have an impact? You know, political and military, that's short lived, um, genetic altering. Uh, creating a creed, but Confucius influence, he was incredibly influential, right? 
He was the primary tool for molding Chinese society for 2,000 years, over one fourth of the population. Uh, Charles Darwin thought he had the best model for civilization. So uh, that should blow your mind a little bit, just get you thinking differently. Um, so how is Confucius our us, right? Um, to what extent do we do things like this? Well, it's a response to the lack of civility in public life. We have that as a problem. Um, he was idealizing. To what extent do we idealize the founding fathers in order to sort of get people to behave? But, you know, how do we idealize them? And for what behavior do we want, right? I think we idealize them as you know rugged individuals, which obviously, if they valued Confucius, they were not. Um, how is it we have a different cultural tradition and situation? Um, all right, let's see. Deliberate tradition, that's kind of the main you know, expression of what Confucius was about. He was a social genius who focused on deliberate tradition. Um, here are the quotes that I picked. Um, and you can refer to these if you want. You should also connect these back with Aristotle's virtues, right? Um, and we can go through those in terms of Aristotle's virtues in class if we have time. Um, and I hope you also have the book. Um, let's see, here's the outline from, oh yeah, we already went over that, the Founding Fathers. There's the article, it's eight pages. Um, here are the themes. Okay, that also was in that previous outline. Um, okay, this one, the news. This is important, even though it's 20 pages, it's not a lot of reading, it's news, and I have underlined the main things I wanna get at. Um, this I think is really important because the Western tradition, Jesus died, right? He didn't get married, he didn't have children, he didn't uh, exercise any kind of authority based on expertise. He wasn't a religious authority. He didn't get connected to an institution. So, so um, that combined with America where people left the past behind, rugged individualism, you have a right declaration. It doesn't talk about phases of life. It doesn't talk about your heart or your character, you know? just free and equal and, you know, right to life, liberty and happiness, however you define it, right? But the founders thought your character was really important because it would control how you define your happiness and that would make a whole lot of difference. But Confucius lived a long life. He went through phases in life and he, you know, this Analec tells you about his model of the different phases that a good life goes through. For, first of all, when you're a student, you should wholeheartedly be a student, just learn everything you can. Then at 30, you get married, you have kids, you have a job, you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off, you hardly think straight. So I tell students, if you think you're stressed now, uh, yeah, sorry, <laughs> it's going to get a lot worse. Um, at 40, right, a lot of people, this is really interesting, because if you do set the right goals, and that's another reason to get a liberal arts education, there's a lot of good reasons after college to have odyssey years, right, to work for nonprofits, to travel, to just try a lot of things because your brain is still growing. In your late 20s, you go, I know what I want now. I know what I want for a career. I'm gonna dig in my heels. 
But if you just spend your life doing what you think somebody else tells you they want you to do, or what you try to please somebody else, and you fall and chain on your feet, you know, just keep doing this because somebody else, pleasing somebody, you're going to have a midlife crisis, okay? You're going to say, I've never done anything I, that I wanted to do, right? If you do the thing you want, even though as obstacles, it'll start coming together at age 40. The other thing is, if you're living just for uh, sexual pleasure, just pleasure, at age 42 in men, your drive, right? Your libido starts to decline. And that's when they tend to have this huge crisis. They divorce their wives and marry somebody, a much newer model, so they can feel young again. And that, you know, you break apart families, you break apart societies. It's very destructive and unraveling the social fabric. So his model is that if, you know, if you're a good person, things will start coming together at 40, not falling apart. Um, at 50, you know, I could intuitively figure out what was to do. At 60, okay, at 70. Finally, at 70, I could sort of do what my heart wanted. But And that's that whole thing of having all your emotions uh, dedicated to the good and also having your intellectual ability to perceive the good. But anyway, so that's a, a model. Um, the inner life of a Confucian. So I talk about that, that it isn't just reacting to other people. It's not just about relationships. Um, this one is the, the article about having an EQ. This guy makes so much money. And there's the article that I referred to before. And that is so incredibly Aristotelian or Confucian or whatever. And he's just packaged it up and, and made money on it. Um, this is George Washington, Rules of Civility. It's like, how many times do we have to go through this, right? Um, and this thing, th these articles are interesting. And I have sort of put a mark the things. So the leader of China, He's vowed a great rejuvenation to restore China to its ancient power. Come on, guys. This is he's he's becoming the new Confucius, right? He's at, he's doing exactly what Confucius did. And I think I'm not quite sure the person who knew, who wrote the article knew that. He might have, but um, all right. China's becoming the world's second large economy. Okay, whatever. It's not something to be afraid of. It's something to figure out, okay, what are we going to do? How are we going to respond um, in, a, in a productive way, in a creative way? We can work together. We can make a better world rather than feel threatened by each other. But anyway, my main point is he's definitely going China and Confucius. He's going to his cultural tradition um, they only have one party, right? Um, they point out, right, the corruption. So when they see the corruption in, excuse me, our political system, when they see how many of our political leaders under Trump, not under Obama, I'm sorry, got uh, indicted for breaking the law, there were five cabinet members, there were a dozen or more of Trump's close associates. Uh, there was tons of evidence showing that they were breaking our laws and they see all the, all the corruption. That helps the Chinese, right? The leader of China says, you see, we have a better system. So, I mean, we have to just really worry about our image, but not just our image, like the substance of who we are uh, because the Chinese might have control of their journalism, but they definitely, you know, are going to find out about the U.S. And, you know, in a lot of cases, they just have to tell the truth about the U.S., but they'll also, you know, obviously distort it at will. 
So we just, we need to uh, figure out how to make our country strong, but not by, you know, feeling threatened or attacking China or demonizing it. Just find a way to, to make our country strong and our middle class strong. Um, right, so the head of, of China is becoming more uh, like a, I don't know, dictator, right? A one person rule, not just one party rule. Um, so they refer to him the way they uh, referred to Mao, this, you know, sacred guy, but that again, Mao was tapping on Confucius. Mao's little red book had analects, basically little excerpts. Um, okay. So, and this says, right, he's, he's referring back to Confucianism. Um, Mao said he wanted to, to smash the grip of Confucius, but that was because the royal family that were corrupt, right, the rich, had co-opted Confucius, right? But nobody remembers that, <laughs> right? Nobody remembers our founding fathers and what they were doing. So, um, so the current leader can quote Confucius once again in order to get achieve his goals, um, and focus on we have a five thousand year old civilization as opposed to those Americans. It's about four hundred years. And they're totally chaotic. Like they don't have the culture that we have. They don't like poetry and music, whatever. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. He runs the country as if it were his own family, right? He's the father of the country. Um, so let's see. This is 2018. That president abolished constitutional limits on presidential terms, which basically made him the permanent leader, right? A tilt toward authoritarian governance. This is also true of Putin and the head of Egypt, the head of Turkey, the head of Poland, the head of Hungary. So I do, it is important for you to know there's this move toward authoritarianism. I think you should also know that Mr. Trump likes these people. He publicly says he likes them, not the head of China, although you know he was conflicted, but Putin, yes. The head of Turkey, Erdogan, yes. Um, the head of Poland, yes. The head of Hungary, yes. Um, the head of the UAE, yes. Um, so that's that's important. He was. You can go check it out. Uh, complimenting authoritarian leaders, um, saying, you know, they're strong, he admires them, blah, blah. All right. So why is there this drive toward authoritarianism and how can we stop it? Um, okay, so I think that the reasons are insecurities and fears, globalization and rising inequality, um, advances in technology, disorienting chaos, right? And so this was written before COVID. And so I do want you to think about that. You're stepping into history at this particular time and your generation is going to have to set a new paradigm, really. You need to deal with, develop resilience toward these kinds of radical changes and shifts. You have to not panic, right? Um, some of your, some of the older people might be more panicked because they're not used to it and it's, what they were used to, they want to get back to the good old days. Don't do that, right? Your generation needs to be more adaptable. Um, he thinks he's the only one. Okay, he really does think 
that China is the new vision, the new model for a functioning country. Uh, and, you know, all I'm saying is be fair to opposing points of view. I look, a philosopher does not want to live in any sort of authoritarian country, but a philosopher can understand why it's compelling, why most people will not behave unless it's they're forced to, to a much higher degree than what I think a philosopher. Philosophers should choose moderation because they don't want authoritarianism. Um, they want stability so that they can have a free mind to think. Anyway, um, this is, I think this newspaper is, um, this article is important because uh, political Confucians defend the approach of the way of the humane authority. This should ring bells right now that you've uh, read some of this. The legitimacy of heaven, earth, and um, the human, right? So just sort of read your way through that. This is important. It was written in 2009, and it says... You know, the U.S. is more backward than we are. Here are the, here is why we're successful. We seek truth from the facts as opposed to the U.S. <laughs> Wait, we used to be the science nation of the world, you know? How do we, how do we lose that? Which obviously we've done. The primacy of people's livelihood, which means a middle class, right? eradicating poverty. That makes politicians really popular. And we're not doing that. We're shrinking our, our middle class and we have political rhetoric that keeps convincing people that that's okay because you want freedom, which means the freedom of rich people to get richer without any government regulation. The importance of holistic thinking, of course, that's what we don't do. <laughs> I'm free to take the vaccine or not, right? Versus look at the impacts, right? We don't have social and political consciousness and the Chinese do. And so they're saying, this is why we're successful. And we, you know, we have priorities, we have a plan and we put our plans in place. Government is a necessary virtue. You need to think about this. Good governance matters more than democracy. You need to think about that. So, of course, most Americans see, see, that's why they're wrong and we're right. You just have to accept that they don't think they're wrong and they think there's a lot of evidence that they're right. So please mix it up in your head, you know, be patient with complexity and ambiguity, be fair to both points of view. Performance legitimacy, um, people, you know, we're gonna do stuff that works. And um, all right, selective learning and adaptation, uh, learning from others is prized, harmony and diversity. Okay, so you could say this is propaganda. You could say it's just looking on the bright side. Fine, do we do that? Yes. All right, so um, if you wanted to write a paper that, you know, would point out complexities and ambiguities on either side of the model of America versus the model of China as the best model moving forward. These are really interesting and important issues. Um, Europe, you know, considers itself the mean between extremes. I know in Indonesia, it's another version. They have their own idea of how to set up a republic. And it's all interesting to me. Um, and it's a free for all, right? I, I do think there's a lot of variety and anything can work or can not work <laughs> because what really matters is who's in charge, whether they care about the common good and whether they are smart enough and they have good advisors and also whether the people 
care about each other. There's so many variables. That's why practical wisdom is so difficult. And why one of the worst things we do is to trivialize it and not notice the background of the people that we elect or who those people appoint to powerful positions and their background. I mean, really, that's basic. Just find the facts. Um, yeah, it boggles my mind. But anyway, we'll see you tomorrow and lots of reading and lots of ideas. We'll probably not finish in the hour and a half, but we will persist. We will move forward. And I did get my yogurt. <laughs> I got my frozen yogurt. It was crowded when I got there, so they had to keep it open a little later. I thought you'd all really want to know that.